Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. How do we actually make decisions? What effect does the group have on our judgment? I just will not tolerate that kind of behavior from you. And as a result of that, what mistakes do we commonly make when we negotiate? What conditions would make this student believe her own lie? Because this one wasn't boring at all. No way that he's going to look at your bill judgment and decision making. This time on discovering psychology. Every day, we have to make decisions, from legal and business ones to what we're going to eat, from what products we buy to whom we're going to marry. No matter how uncertain life is, we have to act decisively, time after time, even if it's just hiring someone else to make our decisions for us. As a species, we like to think of ourselves as pretty good at this sort of thing. But then in comes a bunch of psychologists to tell us we've been living a pipe dream. Much of their research has cast grave doubts on the rationality and wisdom of our decision making, revealing the failures of human intuition, even when it comes to the best and brightest among us. Traditionally, social scientists identify two reasons why people lapse into irrationality. First, there is the influence of the crowd. As part of a mob, the individual can no longer think independently or clearly. In the extreme case, mob psychology becomes mass hysteria. A second view, held by Sigmund Freud and others, argues that people stop being rational and become bestial when driven by primitive needs that demand immediate gratification, sex and aggression. To Freud, society's task is to control these animal urges by socially appropriate rules of conduct. Today, cognitive and social psychologists look for the origins of irrationality or mental fallibility elsewhere, within the very processes of the mind itself. Fundamental to the way humans make judgments, inferences, and decisions are mental strategies that can be biased. When a systematic way of thinking is responsible for an error in judgment, it's called a cognitive illusion. Not that there's anything wrong or irrational with using these kinds of mental strategies. It's just that people don't always discriminate between appropriate and inappropriate conditions for using them. In fact, human irrationality and stupid decisions are cut from the same cloth as human reason and wise decisions. Let's see how. Amos Tversky of Stanford University and Daniel Kahneman of the University of California, Berkeley, are two of the world's leading researchers studying how and why people make illogical choices. Maybe we can begin with the big question. What contribution has psychology made to our understanding of judgment and decision making? Uh, there are two approaches to the study of decision making. One, which has been called normative, asks the question of how we ought to make decisions. Uh, what is the nature of rational decision making? The second approach, which we call descriptive, asks not how decisions ought to be made, but how they are actually being made in practice. Well, the major theme of psychological research, as it turns out, is that uh, the normative model of rational and coherent decision making isn't the terrific model of how people actually make judgments and decisions. When people are put to the test, then it turns out that although their intuitions are often correct, they're also often systematically wrong in ways that are predictable and are quite systematic. Now tell me, how are we going to prove to our audience that they're not as logical as they think they are, that their everyday thinking often departs from these normative rules of rationality? 
Well, actually, it doesn't take very complicated questions. We use quite simple questions about which people have some intuitions and impressions, and we can compare the way that people approach these questions to the way that they should approach them. And while you try to solve the problems, we'll also show you some of the responses of people we taped earlier. Okay, first we have two questions which have to do with making judgments. Number one, are there more words in the English language that begin with the letter K, or words in which K is the third letter? K first or K third? I think that there's probably more words with the letter K as the third letter. I think it's more of the first letter. I'll go for the first letter. I would assume they begin with K. Okay, question number two. Imagine that you're about to spend a month in the Middle East. Which would you worry about more, a terrorist attack or a traffic accident? Terrorist attack. Terrorist attack. Terrorist attack. Danny, are they right? No, they're actually wrong in both cases. There are twice as many English words that have K in the third position than words that begin with a K. And if you go to the Middle East, you should really be much more worried about getting hurt in a traffic accident than getting hurt by a terrorist attack. There are simply many, many more of those. The responses to these questions illustrate a very general principle that people use in reasoning under condition of uncertainty, uh, which we call the availability heuristic. Obviously, people do not know how many English words start with the letter K as opposed to words that have K in the third position. So how would they answer a question of that kind? What they do, we suggest, is they try to imagine examples of words that start with a K, such as key, what have you, and try to think about words that have K in the third position. Now, because it's much easier to think of words that start with a given letter than words that have that letter in the third position, they come with the impression that there are many more of them. Danny, how does this notion of the availability heuristic help us understand the Middle East example? Well, again, it's the same thing. Uh, we assess the probability of the likelihood of an event by the ease with which instances come to mind. Well, when you think of the Middle East, you think of terrorist attacks, and you don't think of traffic accidents. And as a result, you are quite likely to worry much more about terrorist attacks than about traffic accidents, uh, which is probably quite unjustified. Okay, here's another problem. This one about making inferences from evidence. Here's a brief description of a woman named Linda. We'll ask you some questions about her. Linda is 31, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy in college. As a student, she was deeply concerned with racial discrimination and other social issues, and participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Now, which statement about Linda is more likely? Linda is a bank teller, or Linda is a bank teller and active in a feminist movement? Bank teller and active, B. The second one, Linda's a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. The Linda's a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. Well, actually, about 90% of the people who are asked this question believe that Linda is more likely to be a feminist bank teller than to be a bank teller. And the reason they do this is that they apply a kind of reasoning that we call reasoning by representativeness or by similarity. They ask themselves how similar Linda is to their stereotype of a bank teller, and she is not, and how similar she is to their stereotype of an active feminist, and she is quite similar or representative of that stereotype. And then they use that thinking about similarity or representativeness to make a judgment of probability. As it happens, however, that judgment is incorrect. It's incorrect because it violates a very basic principle of logic, namely that a more inclusive event is necessarily more probable than a more specific event. That is, the set of people who are bank teller certainly includes the set of people who are both feminist and bank teller. Therefore, the set with a larger extension necessarily defines a more probable event. All right, here's another question we asked. Is the Mississippi River longer or shorter than 500 miles? Then we asked people to guess the actual length here are their responses. Longer. And how long do you think it is? Must be close to 1,000 miles. Longer? Maybe 1,200? Longer than 500 miles. About 700 miles. Then we asked another group of people a similar question. 
Is the Mississippi River longer or shorter than 5,000 miles? We also asked them to guess the actual length. I think it's shorter, probably about 2,500 miles long. Shorter, about 2,000. Shorter, between two and 3,000 miles. The actual length of the Mississippi River is 2,348 miles. When we asked longer or shorter than 500 miles, the average answer was only about 1,000 miles. Longer or shorter than 5,000 miles, the average was 2,000 miles. How typical is it to get such divergent answers to problems such as that? This is quite a common pattern. This phenomenon may be described as an anchoring effect in which the initial number, even though it's not a very credible estimate of the quantity in question, uh, pulls the estimate, the final estimate, in this, in this direction. Danny, is this anchoring bias limited to estimates of numbers, or does it hold for things that don't involve numbers at all? Well, it's not limited to numbers. And the, the general psychological principle here is that when you have information or an impression floating in your head, even when it's discredited or you don't quite believe it, it tends to have the weight of a suggestion and to pull your impressions toward itself, and that's the essence of the anchoring phenomenon. So if, for example, you once believed something or you were given information about an individual, say, or about yourself, which later out to be false, you don't completely wipe the scale and start afresh. Some residue of the initial impression is still there. So the anchoring effect is much broader than a numerical thing. Mm -hmm. Our last example takes you into the arena of risky choices. Do you follow a risk-seeking strategy or risk-averse strategy? Let's see in the following example. Which would you choose if you were gambling? A. You have an 85% chance to win $100. B. You have a sure gain of $85. I take the sure win. Sure gain of 85. A sure gain of 85. People generally prefer $85 for sure over the gamble with the same expected actuarial value, and this pattern has been known as risk aversion. It's an aversion to a risky prospect. Now suppose you have a 100% chance of losing $85, or an 85% chance of losing $100. Which would you choose? Then I would take the chance. I would take the 85% chance of losing. I'll take the 85% chance of losing. <laughs> In this case, people seem to prefer the gamble over the sure loss. And that, again, is a very characteristic pattern. Notice that in this problem, just as in the one before, the gamble and the sure thing have, are equal in some sense. You, have, you can either lose $85 for sure or have a gamble which has an expected value of losing $85. But here, unlike the previous case, people very generally prefer the gamble. The notion of accepting a dead loss is unthinkable for people. And the significance of the pattern that Danny just described is that people are willing to take often a very un unreasonable risk of a much greater loss in order to avoid that sure loss. So Danny, how would you sum up the practical implications of all we've been talking about? What this analysis suggests is that under some conditions, and the conditions are knowable, we should not trust our intuitions because we are liable to predictable errors and to predictable biases. And it's not 